and welcome to my studio for the 16th episode of the Green Bean Podcast. My name is Katie Green and this is Jack. Uh, we are both really, really glad that you're here. Actually, Jack's just busy eating flies, but that's okay. I'm glad you're here, whether this is your first visit or you've been here many times before. Welcome and I'm looking forward to sharing some creative projects with you. So... In this episode, I have got some drawing to share with you. I've got news about the new issue of the Green Bean Zine that I'm about to start working on. I have some crochet instead of knitting, and I have a little bit of sewing to share with you. And then, well, I guess it's sewing as well, actually. I recently went on a workshop where I made my own pair of shoes and I took some video of that, so I'm really look, looking forward to sharing that process with you as well. So settle in with whatever project you're working on, and I hope you enjoy seeing what we've been up to. Today is the day when I'm going to be starting work on the new Green Bean. Um, if you're not sure, the Green Bean is a zine that I publish. Um, when I first started working freelance about 10 years ago, I published it once a month and then when I realised that was crazy, once every two months, and then when I realised that was still crazy, I published it when I, feel, when I felt like it. And then I had to stop because of various health issues and uh, working full-time on my graphic novel, Lighter Than My Shadow. Um, but in the last year I've brought the Green Bean back and I published the first new issue, if you like, in March this year. And it's been so well received. I've, I can't believe really the love that there's been for it. I've, and I really love creating it. The main reason that I create the Green Bean is it's to give a space to the kind of things that I like to draw, the kind of things that I like to think about. Um, in terms of my creative interests, my, um, my work is quite diverse. I like reading and researching, I like sketching, but I also like designing knitting patterns and sewing patterns. And the green bean kind of provides a roof for all of those things to live under that still feels like me rather than trying to figure out how, how they fit together. So the green bean is something, it, it's very close to my heart and I'm really excited about starting the next issue. Um, there's a bit of a clue here as to what the theme is gonna be. Um, I've chosen lichens and I've been obsessed with lichens for a very long time. They're just fascinating. I don't, don't want to call them creatures, they're not creatures, they're not plants, they're, um, they're a symbiosis between fungi and algae and the way that those two different um, beings interact with each other and produce these um, organisms that are beautiful and various and yeah, I'm really enjoying learning about them. I've just started reading this book and I'm going to be devoting the whole issue of the green bean to lichens. So what I'm going to be working on today is the front cover. And I was always told when I was at school and when I was at art college that designing the front cover is the last job to do once the main project is finished. But for me it's the other way around. I really like doing the cover first because it sets the tone and the mood for the whole project. So I've done a few rough sketches and I've picked a layout that I'm happy with. 
So I'm going to transfer that layout onto the scratch board and then start scratching away. So what I'm doing first is ruling out some guidelines that are going to shape where I place this image. So I'm using a piece of scratch board that is larger than the size that the green bean will be printed. The green bean is printed at A5. So what I'm doing is scaling my illustration up, but it needs to be in the same proportions as A5. And scratch board annoyingly doesn't come in standard A paper proportions. So I've ruled off this little bit at the edge of the page to know that my illustration can't go that past that point. Um, and now I'm going to start sketching in where the image goes. Because the green bean is a personal project, it's really nice that I don't have to worry about deadlines. Um, in fact, the last issue that I released took me pretty much five years to put together. And I'm very much hoping that this one won't take that long. But because I took so long after that one, I don't really have a realistic sense of how long this one's going to take. Um, I've toed and froed about whether I was going to talk about this on the podcast, but um, I've always said that I wanted to be honest about things, so I don't think there's any harm in it. Um, so I struggle with a condition called PMDD, which stands for premenstrual dysphoric disorder. Um, it's like very severe PMS. Um, any woman who's experienced any level of PMS will understand how stressful that can be. And what I experience is a very exaggerated form that can make me extremely physically unwell, but also has very serious mental health symptoms. And frankly, I mistook it for a mental health problem for a long time. Um, so I've only really had this diagnosis for 18 months or so, and I'm still adjusting to it in terms of how I manage it, but also in terms of how I manage my work. So... I'm really lucky in a sense that I'm freelance and self-employed so I get to organise my work and decide which days I'm going to work and which hours I'm going to work. But it also means I have to be very mindful about my scheduling. Even though I take medication which thing keeps things stable and manageable, I still have to plan all of my calendar around my monthly hormonal cycle which is fine, but it means that there needs to be a rhythm of things. I can't expect the same level of energy and interest and passion and excitement from myself every single day. It really fluctuates and I'm just learning to bear that in mind. And in the process of learning that, I'm learning how long work takes me because um, 
I'm not trying to work myself into the ground like I've done in the past. I'm really trying to keep things sustainable because I enjoy what I'm doing and I want to be able to continue doing it. So yeah, this green bean is going to be an experiment. I'm hopeful this time I'm going to stay well enough to keep working on it consistently, whereas the last one I was very unwell and had to take long breaks across those five years. So it wasn't five years of solid working on it by any stretch. I also had a full-time job during that time and various other things. Um, so this one, it's going to be my main project apart from work that I'm doing for clients at the moment. Um, so we'll see, we'll see how long it takes. Um, I'm not even going to say any kind of hope that I have for when it will be out. I'm just going to play it by ear, see how it goes and it will be ready when it's ready. People often express concern when I show myself working with Scratchboard that um, it might be really difficult for me to correct mistakes, that it feels like a very permanent medium. And I just thought I'd do a quick demonstration to show you that that is not the case. So for example, if I were to scratch off a little bit here and then decided, oh, actually that's wrong, or I wanted that to be black, I can use a black Posca pen, which is just a paint pen, and scribble right over it and it's black again. And once that's dry, I'll show you that I'm able to scratch back into it just as though it was the original blackboard. So it's really very forgiving. Um, I'm not sure that the camera will pick it up, but the original surface of the board is shiny and the surface of the paint pen will be matte once it's dry. So it can look quite different on the original artwork. Um, but I don't generally sell my original artwork, so it doesn't really matter how it looks, so long as once it scans and it flattens all of those blacks so they're the same tone, then it works just fine for reproduction. So I'm pretty happy with it. Let's see, is it dry enough to scratch yet? Yeah, I can just go straight back in there and scratch it white again. The other thing that that means, of course, is you can get these Posca pens in lots of different colours. So you can use the baseboard of black and white, but you can add different colours and then scratch into them as well. It's not something I do very much of. I am a huge fan of the black and white, but um, it adds different depths and different possibilities to working with Scratchboard, which is always exciting.
I reckon it's probably going to take me a couple of weeks, at least a couple of weeks here and there to finish working on this front cover. So I've got the title that's going here. I'm going to have a branch that comes over the top with some um, of those lichens that hang from the trees that I see on Dartmoor quite a lot. And then at the bottom I'm going to have some rocks with the Dartmoor landscape in the background. So lots of detail, lots of scratching. Um, yeah, it's going to take me a good while to finish this piece.
I'm working on some crochet today and that's a change from my usual knitting content. I am both a knitter and a crocheter but I do knit more because I find that crochet is a little hard on my wrist. As someone who draws for a living I have to take care of my right hand and um, crochet is a little bit more of a, uh, a tricky movement for me so I have to be mindful about how much crochet I get up to. But when I saw this pattern, I fell in love with it and I hadn't done a crochet project yet this year. So I thought this was the one I would choose. It is the Drusilla Shawl by Faye Dashbahues. You might know Faye from the Crochet Circle podcast. Um, she is also the very talented lady who manufactures my laser cut sheet brooches for me. So. There are lots of connections there. Um, this pattern was published in the John Arban Textiles uh, Annual, the first issue that came out this year. Um, and it is, I'm gonna hold it up and show you, but even though this is the first time I've shown it on the podcast, it is actually of significant size because I've been working on it for a while. So I'm not sure how much I will be able to show you on the, on the screen because it's quite enormous. So it's a crochet shawl. Um, it in, the pattern includes two options for a triangular shawl or a diamond shaped shawl. So you begin crochet at this bottom point here and work outwards. And then once you've reached the widest point, you work back inwards to finish your diamond shape. And the way that the pattern is written is you can use you can work the pattern to use up exactly the amount of yarn that you have. And I chose to make a four skein version, which is why mine is so enormous. That's four skeins of four ply, so it's that 1200 meters of crochet. It's a lot. And it's gonna be an enormous cozy shawl that I can double over and really wrap myself up in, which is perfect for the current season. Um, if you don't know, I'm in the southwest of England and it's summer at the moment. The temperatures are about 30 degrees Celsius. It's, it, it's pretty warm and a large shawl is not really necessary. It's also got to that stage where actually it's like a blanket to be working on it. You probably can't see on the camera, but there is a small dog sitting on my lap, currently wrapped in the shawl. Uh, he doesn't seem to mind it too much. It's quite cool indoors, so he's not overheating, but it's definitely not not a garment that I'm in a rush to finish because I need to wear. So I'm just leisurely putting a row on it here and there. The yarn that I'm using for this project is a John Arban yarn. Um, it's actually something that I've had in my stash for a couple of years. I bought it at their open day, I think two years ago. It's from their Harvest Hues range, which is a blend of organic merino and Svotblas, which is a Dutch, well, originally a Dutch breed, but they are very common now in the UK and they're a naturally dark brown, blackish sheep. So they use it to add a bit of depth to the color because the merino is white. Um, and something that John Arban do that's particularly unique is they dye, they have dyed fibre and they blend the colours on their, um, on their combs. So this has got an amazing depth of different greens and blues in it when you look at it really closely. The, um, the particular colour that I'm using is called Juniper. Um, but to be honest, I could use any of the colours in the Harvest Hues range. I do have a few more in my stash. I obviously am especially partial to the greens, but there's beautiful oranges, golds, reds, really, really delicious tones in there. So it's a lovely yarn. This is my first time working with it. And it's got a nice combination of, um, obviously Merino is very soft, but the Zwoblers adds a little bit of character to it. So it doesn't feel just like buttery soft merino. I'm really really enjoying working with it and I think it's looking beautiful in this shawl. It's amazing to me that I've been knitting shawls, crocheting. This is my first crocheted shawl 
but it's also my first green shawl, which will surprise anybody who's been a long-term viewer of this podcast because I am... Um, I do tend to mostly make green things, and certainly I tend to mostly buy green yarn. So I'm quite surprised that this will be my first green shawl. I'm going to talk a bit about my crochet hook because I know that somebody is bound to ask. So I have a wooden furls crochet hook. It's a 3.5 millimeter and it's wonderful. I love it. So I don't um, like crochet hooks that are very thin. I have to have something that has a little bit more for my hand to hold on to. Again, because I get RSI and kind of weird muscular things going on with my hand. So I find the larger handle is necessary. I also really love the feel of working with wooden tools. I think I've talked about that with knitting needles before. I use metal needles out of necessity when I need really small ones, but given a choice, I always prefer wood. So I found out about these Fells crochet hooks via Loop in London, um, and I actually went into the shop when they were stocking them. I'm not sure if they stock them anymore. Um, but I went in the shop when they were stocking them and they very graciously let me sit on the sofa upstairs in the shop and try out, I think, every different hook that they had in stock to find the one that felt right, because they all were slightly different. They do different woods and the tips of them are slightly different. So I ended up picking one that has quite a sharp point at the top, which I really like, and um, just one that felt nice in my hands. Um, it was not a cheap crochet hook, it was a serious investment that I saved up for and it is really the only crochet hook that I use. So I very much either pick projects that are appropriate for this size hook or if I need to um, make something a specific size I will work out, I will regauge the pattern so that I can work with this crochet hook because at the moment I can't afford another one and that's fine because I, I absolutely love this one. Um, it was definitely worth the expense but um, yes I can't see myself having a full collection of all the different sizes of crochet hook from Fells. It, it just doesn't make sense but I do love the one that I have. I am so happy to be sharing a new sewing project with you today. I think I possibly talked about this project in the last episode, um, but the last episode was a while ago. It might even have been the episode before. Certainly this is a project that's been in my mind for a long time and I kept putting it off and putting it off because I was busy and telling myself I didn't have the time and then just this weekend past, I thought, 
I'm never going to have the time. I need to just make the time. Um, and the reason I was putting it off is because I wanted to do some embroidery. And anyone who's ever done embroidery will know that it's not a quick process. It's time consuming, it's detailed, it's finickety. So I love it, but it does take time. There's no rushing it because you want a new dress. So I've decided to both treat myself and challenge myself to just take it slowly. Um, I'm in no rush for a dress, although like the green shawl, I don't have a green dress either. So this is very much a uh, necessary addition to the wardrobe. And it hasn't escaped my notice that the two greens I'm working with will go very nicely together. So I'm, I'm working my way towards a head to toe green outfit, which makes me very happy. But I'm trying to just appreciate the process of the embroidery and let it take as long as it takes, uh, rather than rush it because I want a green dress. Um, the other thing that's going to take a while is, because uh, this is a linen fabric, but it's very fine and a little bit see-through when it catches the light, I'm going to want to make a slip to wear underneath it. So although I'm making yet another version of the same dress that I make all the time, um, it's going to have a little modification. I've never made a slip before. so. That's going to be a new challenge and take a little bit of extra time. Now, regular viewers are probably sick of hearing about it, but just in case, um, the dress that I make, the dress that I continue to make, the dress that I'm wearing, um, is from a Japanese sewing book called Formal and Little Black Dress by Yoshiko Tsukiyori. Um, I adapted the dress by, oh, what did I do? I lowered the waistline so it had an empire line and I lowered it to sit at my natural waist. Um, I also lengthened the skirt to hit below the knee and I added pockets. And for various different incarnations I've made, I've added different details. So you can see this version has a little bit of lace on the sleeve. I've also added a skirt lining to one version. Um, so I like to just add a little touch that's a bit different each time. But honestly, this is the dress that I reach for whenever I open my wardrobe. It's the thing that I put on first as soon as it comes out of the laundry. And until I find a dress that I'm more excited to wear, I'm not in any particular rush to make anything else. I'm, I'm just happy making the same thing. That's fine by me. You might have noticed that I don't have any markings on the fabric apart from the cutting lines. So this is actually the back piece of the dress. Um, I've cut the sides and the bottom, but I've left the top with a bit of length on it because I need that extra fabric to tuck into my embroidery hoop. So I've marked out where I'm going to cut for the top of the shoulder and the neckline, and I've marked the seam allowance and where the facing will hit. So all of my embroidery will have um, like in this dress, a facing that lies against it on the inside so my the back of my work won't tickle my neck. But apart from that, there are no marks, which is to say that I've not planned my embroidery, I'm freestyling it. And I realise that that might terrify some people, <laughs> but to me it's utterly liberating. I guess I think of embroidery like drawing with thread, and it's... Um, 
yeah it's like not making any pencil marks before you start working with ink sometimes it is terrifying i would never do that for a client because they always want to see what they're going to get but because this is a project just for me and it's about relaxing and it's kind of meditative it actually i think it's an important part of it that it doesn't have a plan that i'm following and i can just take it intuitively and see what happens <laughs> So a little bit more about the materials I'm using. The fabric that I've chosen for the dress is a pure Japanese linen which I bought from Ray Stitch. Um, I actually ordered it online rather than buying it in the shop but it was green so I was never going to not like it. Um, the colour is called seaweed and it's this lovely pale sagey green. When I first got it I was a little bit disappointed that it wasn't more olivey. But now that I've been working with it, I actually love the colour and I think it's going to be ideal for this summer dress that I'm making. And the thread that I'm using, I had actually intended to buy just a standard DMC or Anchor embroidery thread, the kind that you can buy in local haberdashery shops over here. And I wanted to find one that was exactly the same colour as the fabric so that the embroidery was, embroidery was a texture rather than um, being in your face, if you like. But I couldn't find one that was a colour match, and all the ones that were tonal were a little bit pale and looked as... I don't know, it just was going to be a little bit too much. So I was really happy when I found this hand-dyed embroidery thread in a little um, knitting and needlework shop in Kansas City in America when I was there earlier this year. I was so happy to find it because it picks up some of the exact colours of the fabric but it has some paler colours as well and that little bit of variegation I think um, makes, makes the embroidery really interesting without me having to think about changing colours so that's really nice. Um, it's a six strand embroidery, thro embroidery thread or floss like the ones that you buy in the craft shop um, but I'm using two strands at a time, so before I start each section of embroidery I'm pulling out just two threads from the six. It had to be quite fine because the linen is very fine. I think anything thicker than two threads and it would have made big holes in the fabric which wouldn't have looked very nice.
So the last thing I wanted to share before closing out this episode is my little adventure with making my own shoes. Um, I definitely think it's really important as a creative person to replenish yourself and fill the well from time to time and it's definitely something that I am guilty of forgetting the importance of. I um, tend to expect myself to keep going and going and going and going and never like remember the importance of putting something back in the system whether that is reading or watching a film or going to an exhibition or learning a new skill or going on holiday all of those things that allow your creative brain to rest and recuperate and give you the space to think about something different i can get very cooped up in this small studio um, spending a lot of time on my own so it's good to get out and meet people and do something different and with that in mind i did something very uncharacteristic uh, bear with me because it's a bit of a story so um, I'd been looking for a while for a new pair of walking boots because my old pair were falling apart and I was really keen to find some that were all leather, leather lining as well as leather outside, um, rather than these synthetic ones that are made with goodness knows what plastics and things. Um, not only are they not very environmentally friendly but they also make my feet really sweaty and I just wanted some very traditional walking boots. Um, so I put a call out on Instagram to see if anyone had any recommendations because I was really struggling to find any. And several people rep recommended a place called Green Shoes, which is actually in Devon, where I live. Um, I was amazed that they were so local to me and I hadn't heard of them before. But they're on the north side of Dartmoor, about an hour's drive from where I live. Um, so I thought I'd go and check them out and a few months ago I went and I ordered a new pair of walking boots uh, you've possibly seen me wearing them in this episode they are fabulously green I wasn't going to pick any other color really um, but on the day that I went to pick up my new boots they happened to have a vacancy in their shoemaking workshop that they were running that day and I didn't have any other plans it was a quiet Saturday so I thought I would give it a go and I had a fantastic time. Um, they very kindly let me record some video footage in the workshop of me making my own shoes. I actually cannot believe that I made a pair of shoes and they're not like a weird looking, odd, handmade looking pair of shoes. They're like a serious pair of shoes. I'm so pleased with myself and I just keep looking at them every time I wear them. Uh, so I thought you'd enjoy seeing part of how they came together.
thank you so much for visiting us for another episode of the Green Bean Podcast. I hope you've enjoyed watching. If you want to catch up with me between now and the next episode, the best place is Instagram, where you'll find me as at Katie Greenbean. I've also recently started an email newsletter, which will be coming out monthly. So if you would like to sign up to that and receive news about what I'm up to, when new episodes are published and information about when my shop is updated and new products and so on and so forth, the link is down below, along with any other things that I've mentioned in the episode. If you need a link, it will be in the notes down below. And finally, if you want to support the podcast, we are on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Katie Greenbean. Um, we offer various different bonuses and rewards for supporters of the podcast. I do live streams and extra episodes and discounts in my online shop as well. Um, if you're not able to join us on Patreon, that's no problem. You can also support the podcast by subscribing or sharing with us. Steady on. You can also support the podcast by subscribing, leaving us a nice comment. We always enjoy reading and, and hearing from you, even if I don't always get around to responding to everybody. I really appreciate all of your feedback and support. So thank you for watching and I will see you next time. Take care. Bye bye. <laughs>